So let's move to the next plenary. It's our honor to have, may I have a big round of applause to welcome our guests? More energy after the dinner, should be. <laughs> Thank you so much. May we now have um, Ms. Li Niao, Chief Executive Officer and Director of Learning at the Absolute Fabulous Theatre Connection, AFTEC, to moderate our talk on Let's Recreate. Ms. Yao is a guest lecturer at Loco University, a published researcher and a regular speaker at conferences in Hong Kong and internationally. She holds degree in literature and education, among other qualifications, from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Harvard Business School Executive Education. May we now welcome Ms. Yao to come on stage. Ms. Yao, good evening. Hello. Um, good evening and welcome to a rather warm reception for a rather cold day. Um, we are now at the third panel, which is the final panel for today's Hong Kong Arts Development Council International Arts Leadership Roundtable, and I'm very privileged to be here. Although we are one short today, I'm sure Benny and Michelle, and hopefully myself, would more than make up for it. So um, the overarching theme for the entire roundtable is recreate. And finally, in this panel three, we're talking about let's recreate. So taking action to see what can be done. And both Benny and Michelle will be doing exactly this uh, this for us. We're looking at the what they're doing, the how they're doing it, and of course, the why why they are doing it. Um, as somebody in arts and education and creative learning, I feel very strongly that in the post-pandemic era, there should be a lot more than this because we need to bring everybody together. But without further ado, can I introduce Mr. Benny Higgins, who is the chairman of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. You would all know the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is a three-week bonanza on a spectacular stratospheric scale of performances from well-known brand names to people who are just going into the art sector. In 2019, in fact, they had over two million audience join the festival. There were over 323 venues over the, in the entire Edinburgh city, uh, plus 3,000 odd productions, clocking up 60,000 shows. So we are talking about an astronomical number here. And uh, Mr. Higgins, Mr. Higgins, all right, uh, not that Higgins of My Fair Lady, but Benny, um, is very experienced as in the financial sector as he is in the public and private sector. He was the inaugural CEO of Tesco Bank. He was the chief executive of retail banking at the Royal Bank of Scotland and the Halifax Bank of Scotland. His extensive public and arts sector chairmanship is a list to be read in half an hour, but I shall restrict myself to the few recently. He was invited by the Scottish Government to be on the advisory group on economic recovery post-COVID-19. He's still the chairman of the National Gallery of Scotland, the Fine Arts Society in London and in Edinburgh, to name a few. Edinburgh Fringe started in 1947, so it is actually celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. He would like to share his chairmanship experiences for us, and maybe even more, on two particular areas, well-being and sustainability. Um, hello, Benny. You will have 15 minutes. You have a clock running, after which I will introduce the second speaker, and then we will go into a 30-minute discussion. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Benny. Thank, thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, I was introducing myself to Michelle earlier, and given that she's in Ottawa, I'm actually in London today. I was explaining that I had spent uh, three years in Montreal, three very happy years. Um, and when I when I heard reference to simultaneous translation, I was reminded that my French Canadian colleagues often wanted me to be simultaneously translated into English uh, because my Scottish accent was so strong. I think it may have uh, become a little softer, but I hope uh, it's not too difficult for anybody who's seeking to, to translate. Um, the French philosopher and writer Albert Camus once said, 
without culture and the relative freedom it implies, society, even when perfect, is but a jungle. This is why any authentic creation is a gift to the future. When we were battling with the height of the pandemic, and as we have sought to emerge from the pandemic, obviously at different stages for different countries and different territories, it was unthinkable that we would face even more crises. And of course, what we have now in, in front of us is you know, an energy crisis, um, economic uh, pressures and geopolitical tensions around the world, not least of all in Ukraine. And it is very important, I think, that we understand the role of culture and well-being, uh, because it matters even more when we are facing uh, difficulties. There's a sh there's a programme which will probably be shown more broadly around the world on uh, BBC at the moment by the famous art historian Simon Sharma about what why ma art really matters and why it matters, especially when things are particularly tough. As was referenced in June 2020, which was really very early in the pandemic, but at that stage we all hoped and thought that perhaps we'd be emerging much sooner than we did. I was asked by the Scottish Government and by our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, to uh, write a report on what kind of economy we should be seeking to create in the aftermath of the pandemic. And one of the two things that I, well, I, I set out to say that we should have a robust economy, of course, uh, because that helps to serve our, our needs. But I also set out the need for it to be resilient. I think the need for resilience in every sense has become much clearer in recent years. But most importantly, in the context of this meeting, we had to set out to create a well-being economy. The uh, pandemic, certainly in the UK and, and in many other countries, exacerbated existing inequalities in our society and indeed created some. It is interesting to note that in the UK, for example, uh, you know, the, the only 20% uh, of people in the bottom half by socioeconomic group were able to comfortably work from home, uh, whereas it was quite the reverse in the top 50%. And inclusion for culture is so, so very, very important. My grandfather um, w was really who brought the culture into my life. And he would, uh, although he was a working class man, a, a docker, he would uh, be a, he was a voracious reader, and it was through his uh, influence that I became interested in literature and the arts. Um, he always talked about the need for a hinterland, which, as many will know, is a German word, which literally means the land behind the port, uh, but is used um, in a broader sense. The word was first used in the English language in 1888 by a geographer, George Chisholm, but in the 70s, um, which is a long time ago for probably most of the people in this audience. Um, Dennis Healy, who was a very famous chancellor and politician in Britain, uh, started to use the word as reference to what people would have in their life beyond what they do for a job day to day. And I'm certainly a strong believer that having a hinterland, having an interest in the arts, having an interest in culture is crucial to not only our own well-being, but how we identify as a country. Um, certainly, as far as I'm concerned, with my many in, my many uh, links to the cultural landscape in Scotland, for me, it's absolutely crucial that Scotland's reputation, both at home and abroad, is characterised in part by its, its very rich cultural heritage. But what can be achieved by culture is quite extraordinary. As was, I think, referenced, I am the chairman of Sistema Scotland. It, is based on a model which was originally in Venezuela, El Sistema. And Sistema Scotland, which is an independent body, takes orchestral music, orchestral music into disadvantaged areas in Scotland. We have five centres in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dundee, Aberdeen and Stirling. The original one was in Stirling, which began about 16 uh, years ago. And it basically takes disadvantaged children, brings them into uh, orchestral music, and it's the, the music is the vehicle, it's not the outcome. The outcome that we seek is to give these young children confidence, to give them courage, um, to give them uh, a level of uh, you know, confidence in relationships uh, with each other and with the music teachers. 
And we've had report after report, which justifies that our, our optimism that we are making a huge difference. And to see music be at the root of giving very deserving children and their families and their communities uh, an opportunity is really quite extraordinary. The Glasgow Centre, where I originally grew up, is only about 100 metres from my first home. Um, and that makes it even more personal than it would be otherwise. But it's an extraordinary um, uh, charity. The National Galleries of Scotland is uh, obviously the, owns the, the, the national collection. And we are in the middle at the moment of uh, completing the, uh, a new wing to exhibit our Scottish collection. That should be open by next autumn. And I think, again, a wonderful opportunity through a very clear focus on inclusion and access to make sure that the, the visual arts um, in Scotland can be enjoyed by not only uh, everybody in Scotland, but indeed visitors who come to see us internationally. Uh, the Fringe uh, in 2021 was very much a reduced fringe uh, because we were still... Well, we thought we were coming out of the pandemic at that point, to be blunt, but then no sooner did we think we were coming out and we were back in lockdown. And it, it was dented by, um, the hopes for 2022 were dented by the Omicron um, variant. And yet in August this year, we managed to have a full-scale physical fringe. Uh, over 80% of the visitors that had it num in number terms that had visited us in 2019 were there. And for the month of August, uh, Edinburgh becomes to the performing arts what Venice is to the visual arts and Cannes is to the film industry. Really quite uh, miraculous this year that we were able to do this. Now, I, um, I think that there is much to learn from, from the Fringe. One of the things we did this year was we sat down and spoke to every one of our stakeholders. We spoke to venues, we spoke to artists, we spoke to local authorities, we spoke to government, we spoke to audiences, and we revisited uh, what we stand for. What's probably least well understood about the Fringe Society is the Fringe Society doesn't actually control the uh, any curatorial influence. And so we effectively convene the event, uh, but we don't control it. Now, many people think we control it. We also don't receive money from, from government. We have to find the funds to run the fringe. Uh, but I'm, I'm delighted to say that it was an absolutely heroic effort. I've only been involved in the fringe for the last 18 months. And during this summer, um, it was quite an insight, quite an education for me to see the challenges that we face to put on the fringe. There are many challenges, not least of all, the cost of accommodation for artists in Edinburgh during the month of August is becoming uh, intolerably high. And it really does pose a significant threat to the fringe. And uh, I'm sure in other countries, the same things are happening. But certainly in the UK and specifically in Scotland, there is a great deal of financial pressure on the culture sector. And it does present, I think, very significant jeopardy. Um, we do find the politicians, needless to say, will say that they see the benefits of, an, of, of a thriving cultural sector. They talk about well-being, but when it really comes to the crunch and we, are, we, we see what gets prioritised and what gets deprioritised, I am fearful that um, uh, the, 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 the strong words and, and optimism will be diluted by a lack of financial support. And so it really is important, it, certainly in my case, that for each of the cultural organisations that I, um, I chair and support, that we are making, putting our best foot forward and looking for other in innovative ways to try and make sure that we can continue to serve um, both, as I say, uh, Scots and indeed international visitors. Um, one of the things I, I feel very strongly about is in a time of crisis, it is absolutely essential for any organisation, and this is perhaps more true for a, a cultural organisation than any other, is that you must make sure that you remain very focused on your sense of purpose. You must also make sure that you stick with your values and don't allow them to be um, diluted in any way. And perhaps just as important as any, it is very important that you do not diminish your ambition. It's very diff very easy in challenging times to allow your, your ambition to be diminished, but it's perhaps the most important time to hold strong and, and maintain ambition. There's a lovely short poem called Hope by Michelangelo, who obviously was better known for using a brush than a pen. 
But he said, the greater danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but rather that it's too low and we reach it. And I think that really does capture very well the importance of ambition. As far as the fringe is concerned, uh, we have very big, uh, very big hopes for next year. There, I, I actually, when 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 I uh, leave this session, which I'm afraid I may have to leave a little early, um, I'm going to see Phoebe Waller Bridge, a uh, very uh, famous name, I'm sure, to many of you. She wrote the re most recent James Bond script, but was best known for Fleabag, probably, which she performed as a one-woman show at the Fringe in 2013 and has now become one of the biggest show, TV shows uh, the UK has seen for, for decades. And she's become the honorary president and she's helping us draw on our alumni of performers. Um, Eddie Izzard has also become an ambassador and we're looking forward to inviting many others too because we need all the help we can get. And the Fringe has not only entertained Scots and entertained international visitors, over the years, but it's also been such a magnificent launch pad for so many performers uh, from street performers. I mean, Eddie Izzard was 20 years ago a street performer. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just quite, and it's interesting to see just how many people feel indebted to the French for giving them such a good start. Um, when we looked at our purpose, um, we worked very closely with an external agency and with our executive team. And I think it's very important to have a purpose that is is both easy to remember but is 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 very meaningful and ours is to give anyone a stage and everyone a seat and i think that is a very strong message of inclusion both for artists and for audiences um i started with the words of a french writer i i conclude with my initial comments with the words of uh former president of the united states john f kennedy he said if artists to nourish the roots of our culture. Society must set the artist free to follow his or her vision, wherever it takes them. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. Uh, I look forward to the, the panel discussion. Thank you very much, um, Benny. I really love that quote about reaching too low and actually getting there. So maybe we could have uh, exemplification from you when we actually move into discussion. Thank you again. Um, our next distinguished speaker um, has also a very distinguished career at the Canada Council for the Arts. She is Michelle Chowler. Currently, she is the Director General of Strategy Public Affairs and Arts Engagement Division. That means, and I have to read this because she practically runs the place, I think. She oversees communications, international coordination and diplomacy, partnership and arts program, research, measurement and data analytics, policy, strategy, planning, content, and my favorite word is foresight. So definitely you're in the right panel, Michelle. The Council actually is the public supporter of the arts in Canada, striving for artistic excellence, reaching especially to local communities and markets, and they also look after the Canada Council Art Bank, which uh, you may or may not know, operates art rental programs. <coughs> Excuse me. Ms. Chowler, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful good morning, or for me, good morning, for you, good evening. Um, thank you for this wonderful invitation and the opportunity to speak with you. Um, so I was very inspired by the topic, uh, you know, it's called Let's Recreate. And I can't think of a more uh, wonderful and inspirational uh, way of thinking of our work. And one of the things, of course, that we're all living with is related to the question of what happened, what, what are we doing in a post-pandemic world? So did the pan did the pandemic really change anything? And there are many discussions about this. I'm sure you're all discussing this. Uh, we just heard from, from Benny on the same topic. Of course, the pandemic changed things. However, we at the Canada Council are having many discussions about what the pandemic has revealed. And there are many 
other devastating realities that have shaped our art sector more strongly in the years and decades that have led up to the pandemic. But these realities um, are so insidious that we didn't always notice them. But what the pandemic, however, has made us realize is that the art sector, like the wider world, uh, is and is unsustainable. We've seen we've seen with the pandemics uh, the inequities in our society much more clearly, and in Canada, uh, a really much more profound understanding of the injustices that are experienced by racialized and indigenous people. We saw that the goals and structures of our art sector are often quite colonial in nature. They're reproducing a very Eurocentric vision of the arts with a hierarchy that favors classical over customary or more deeply rooted cultural expressions. We saw more fully how artists and arts workers' careers are precarious and poorly remunerated, which um, Many, as a result of the pandemic, uh, arts workers left the sector, and often it was only the very privileged who could afford to stay, which continued to perpetuate many inequities. We also saw a big citizens movement uh, in Canada that would not tolerate the status quo. Um, they were engaging in the arts in different ways, and often, of course, as you all know, and we're doing now digitally, uh, we see a generation that's much more socially conscious and they want their arts experiences to reflect this. Of course, um, we see a world that remains vulnerable to conflict and war and that and those conflicts have global ramifications. And the climate crisis, uh, we see, you know, we've been seeing its immediate impacts, particularly on the most vulnerable peoples in the world. And we often see a grim future that's coming our way. So these are really significant issues that, and it's easy, you know, we often hear this at times, it's easy to say that arts funders, because that's what the Canada Council is, don't have the power to address them. We could say, you know, we give grants, we're not here to save the world. We could say that this is the work of political leaders, diplomats, scientists, econ economists, but we at the Canada Council really believe that the arts funders hold the potential to create a more sustainable arts sector and ultimately influence a more sustainable world. And so we've been thinking a lot about how to do this, to, to uh, go back to Lynn's uh, introduction. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking about the role of arts funders and what kind of shifts. And we I've identified in my notes here that I'll, I'll speak with you today, be happy to engage with, is four major paradigm shifts for arts funders. And I'll just very briefly uh, give you an idea of what those paradigm shifts are. So the first we're talking about redistribution. So arts funders really need to think about the question of redistributing, and we're talking about ourselves. So the Canada Council, I'm not here to give lessons to everybody, but we're hoping that the arts funders sector will engage with us in these conversations. How to redistribute our attention, our efforts, and our financial resources to reach marginalized and underserved communities and address inequities of the past. We want to think very carefully about which communities are, met, are marginalized and underserved in the regions that we serve. So in this, this is really about a question of re also redistributing of our funding, which we all know is not limitless. We need to think about how we can redistribute our funding so that it has the greatest impact possible. Is that impact with marginalized communities to build their capacity? What is that impact? And those are the questions we're profoundly looking at. So we, we're thinking about redistribution in other ways as well. How can we redistribute our decision making so that members of marginalized communities are making decisions about policies and programs that affect them? And we can also talk about redistributing our attention, like who are we spending time with our outreach and communications efforts so that we can build those relationships with a much broader uh, range of communities and not what we call our, our usual clients. Although we don't wanna lose those either, we wanna continue and build the relationships in a much more inclusive uh, manner that, that has a space for everyone at the table. And talking about decision tables or tables, another paradigm shift we're looking at is um, how arts funders, we want to ensure that the arts have a seat at major decision tables in our society. 
So for example, we want the arts to be part of conversations about climate change, social security, mental well-being, as Benny was talking about, social isolation, public health, among many other areas. So why do the arts need to be part of these conversations? We think in part because these conversations impact the arts, but more importantly, because the arts are visionary and persuasive. And these are elements that are often lacking in big policy decisions uh, that are made in the world. So why do we feel that arts councils or arts funders are well-placed to do this work? Can't we think it's because we are uniquely connected to both the arts and wider government and its many spheres of public life. This is something that we really realized during the pandemic as the council um, and our leaders, our council leaders were brought into meeting with leaders from many different fields to, to discuss how are we responding to the crisis. So arts funders are very well connected and let's use those connections. The third paradigm shift I want to raise is how arts funders need to articulate shared goals for the arts and build consensus among many players about how to collaborate for an improved and more sustainable sector. We cannot make progress on any of the things I've talked about so far, like sustainable arts careers or the climate crisis or equity, if we're not trying to be on the same page. So arts funders are well-placed to do this work because we're in conversations with almost all parts of the arts sector um, who sometimes are not in conversations with one another. So at the Canada Council, um, our reach is, is quite vast. We are able to reach across geographic and linguistic divides uh, both to work in both remote regions and big cities and with the breadth of artistic practices across the country and also internationally. At present, um, for us, our experience at the council is that artists and arts organizations too often think themselves as the winners or losers of public funding. And we are trying to change this paradigm or this way of thinking so that everyone sees themselves as a winner when we're working together to achieve a more sustainable arts ecosystem. Which brings me to my last point, which is about how arts funders need to fund differently. So this is what we're doing now. We're rethinking what we fund as well as how we fund. In terms of what we fund, we want to broaden our definitions of what we support to be more inclusive to arts practices that have been marginalized in the past, and also to support innovation that addresses systemic problems in the sector. In terms of how we fund, arts funders need to find ways to be as accessible as possible. That era of gatekeeping um, is over, but we have not yet um, finished our work to opening ourselves with more accessible languages, more accessible platforms, accessible application processes. And this, of course, is deeply connected to the idea of redistribution that I've uh, just talked about. We also want to make our funding decisions in different ways. So peer assessment is one of the central uh, manners in which we deliver our council funding and uh, manage our process. But there is value in broadening our understanding of peers to include those who may be on the margins, who are outside perhaps of some of the immediate uh, clients that we serve. Um, those who share the arts, arts sector's desire to create a more sustainable world. So we're happy to go uh, more in depth with these paradigm shifts in our conversation. And if nothing else, I just want to influence or emphasize that arts funders have a lot of influence in our society, sometimes more than we realize. And this is a unique moment in our history where we can ensure that our influence contributes to a more sustainable arts sector and world. Uh, that seems quite daunting, but we know we're not alone in this work. We want to share our experiences with one another, learn from one another, change with one another, which is why these opportunities to be part of these international and other uh, roundtable discussions are so valuable. So I'll hope you look at the Canada Council Strategic Plan, which is on our website and called Arts Now More Than Ever. It was written during the pandemic, so we were very much influenced by what was happening in our world. And for us, it's a guiding document as we undertake many of these paradigm shifts and hope that it offers some inspiration or at least an opportunity to have conversations with other funders and arts organizations as we transform our work. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So it's time for panel discussions. So thank you, Michelle, for the insightful sharing on the ways to strengthen the art sector, especially during COVID. And uh, that this is the best of time. This is the worst of time. It depends on how we judge it. And also for Benny's presentations, sustainability and inclusions are the key. And um, resemble so much of what Benny has said. And so I wouldn't have to think deeply. And Okay, so the setup is ready. So may we now again invite Ms. Lin Yao to come on stage again to initiate the discussion for us. Ms. Yao, please. Thank you very much. I would like to start, if I may, by reading a few lines from the Art Now More Than Ever five-year strategy plan from Canadian Council of Arts because I think it perfectly ties in to what Benny and Michelle were saying a while ago. And I paraphrase, art, the arts come from a hopeful place and it forges and mends relationships even in a time of crisis. The arts entertain us, comfort us and bring us together. The arts nourish our sense of belonging, strengthening our connections to the wider world and as well as to communities. The power of the arts endure when everything else is falling apart. The arts is an essential need because we see the humanity of another person. I think that is so succinctly concisely and beautifully written. And with that, I wonder if I can ask the first question. We're talking about accessibility and inclusion. In a time of a post-pandemic or economic downturn, how are we to achieve that? Benny spoke a bit on his personal experience moving into Sy uh, Systema Scotland and Michelle also use the word of accessibility, marginalized community. So Benny, since you have to leave a bit earlier, perhaps I could pose the question to you first. How would the Edinburgh Festival Fringe move towards this kind of inclusion? Thank I, you. I think, yeah, I, I think what we need to do is to make what we already do more accessible. Um, I, I mean, if I was to take an example of maybe the visual arts where um, there are some people who sometimes say to me, why don't we put on exhibitions that are more suited to a more um, diverse and therefore a perhaps more inclusive audience? I fundamentally think that what, what the great art, whether it's performing art or it's visual art, um, is actually right for everybody. And I, I personally think it's what we must do is just make the accessibility easier in terms of cost and the way, the way we communicate with different constituencies. Um, education is such an important part. So we have at the Fringe and at the National Guards of Scotland very strong links with education. And we, 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 we have very strong links with making sure that we make the, the Fringe accessible and available to a broader church. Um, so I think that that really is very important. I mean, if I may say so on funding though, it's quite interesting because I'm working across different cultural organizations. Um, it, Organisations that can talk to their own audience in terms of raising funds perhaps don't realise that while things are tough, it still is an advantage. And of the organisations I represent, Systema Scotland, where the audience is deprived communities exclusively uh, with very large refugee communities and at least one of the centres, um, you know, the, the communities themselves have no access or ability to be able to support the charity other than through their goodwill, which is extremely important. Um, and so whilst we do find it challenging both at the Fringe and at the National Galleries, there at least is a, a, an opportunity to talk to your own audience. And clearly funding, as, as Michelle said, will have to be re, kind of reimagined in order for us to make sure that we can do all the things we need to do. But I put inclusion and access at the very top of my agenda for what we need to stand for, because that's what can engender uh, the, the organisations, the, the opportunity to truly um, make a difference in people's lives, because art can do that, and it is never more important than at times like this. Thank you, Benny. Michelle? 
So, yeah, I mean, I think the idea, I, I completely agree with Benny. I think uh, the issue of inclusion and accessibility is uh, uh, something that is top of mind to all organizations, whether you're the arts organization itself or you're an arts funder and looking at the question of how we ensure that access I guess, uh, you know, one practical or very concrete example of something the Canada Council is doing is related to how we've shifted how we fund um, Indigenous arts. Uh, We uh, have taken a a new approach around the idea of self-determination. And what that means is that we created a space in the organization um, around uh, shared decision making and giving over power. So we created a program uh, that is developed by Indigenous people, managed by Indigenous people, assessed by Indigenous people, using new criteria and different language than what you would think of a traditional arts council. And so I think when you are able to demonstrate concrete actions, I remember when we were right um, the language is so critical. So um, it inspired me again. I'm thinking, oh, yes, it's true. You know, we wrote this in the, right in the midst of, you know, do, of the pandemic. And it was so um, deeply revealing to us how the arts was critical to the recreation, the rebuilding of the sector. Um, and it, so thank you for the question. Yes. Um it's all about a legacy as well, or sustainability, actually, which both of you also mentioned. Sustainably in, in, in the literal sense, when you have to have a continuation of the Edinburgh Fringe or all the work that you do at the Canada Council. It is also about climate change. So this brings me to my second point, that the arts can no longer uh, operate in silos. Um, with those who are converted to the arts. As we heard from an earlier panel on digital art, we really have become a bridge across sectors. How would the both of you actually use this kind of um, wide expanse of bridging ability by the arts to reach out to different stakeholders, especially to funders, since the fringe, as Benny says, is not funded by the government? So how would we play to the strength of the arts to reach out to other sectors for public-private partnership? Who would like to take this first? Benny, would you like to, since you might okay, need okay. to? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, look, I, I think it's very important that artists in any of the art forms both reflect the zeitgeist of what's going on in the world that we live in but also seek to influence it. And it's certainly one of the strongest messages that we have at the fringe, that we genuinely, as I said um, earlier, that, you know, I think a very helpful and important strap line for us now is to give anyone a stage and everyone a, a seat. And that talks to the idea that we've got to reflect the complexity of the world we're, we're in, the challenges we face, and art as, as you, you referred to earlier is such a, an extraordinarily powerful way to talk to the challenges we face in the world. And that's what funders are looking for, at least the enlightened ones. They want to know that we are going to present a very diverse um, fringe and we are determined to do so. But we must also recognise that in our convening power, I think that the, the notion of convening power has become much more important in my mind than, than, than it maybe used to be. And I think it was actually during my economic report on the recovery from the pandemic that, you know, governments and other and other organisational bodies can obviously influence things by investing, by by taking actions. But convening power is very important, too. And I think the fringe society has the ability to convene the discussion between the artists, the audiences and funders about subjects that matter. And, you know, we, we, I think we, we all are, would be in agreement that, you know, climate change is, is certainly one of them. Um, there are many others. Um, I think inequality is, it, you know, there's a kind of tragedy that um, inequality is getting worse in our societies rather than better. Thank you. That's a wonderful and very powerful idea of having the Edinburgh Fringe as a convener to bring in different sectors for discussion. Michelle? 
I was going to say exactly what Benny said. I think the power to convene, the power to influence and to, but, you know, to make the case um, is often, you know, again, the, I'll go back to the pandemic. We realized that how were people when we were all in quarantine, sitting at home, uh, isolated, suffering from mental, you know, mental challenges because of our uh, people being depressed, people being anxious. Uh, we discovered, and I think to no surprise to anybody, how the arts was actually one of those things that saved many people because it enabled human connections, even through using screens, you, all these experiences that, that we saw. But I think back to, you know, concrete, concretely, how do we connect with other sectors? Um, of course, at the Canada Council, we use our opportunities to develop very innovative partnerships in order to bring the arts sector at the same table as other sectors, whether it's the health sector, whether it's the finance sector. So an, an example we just uh, experienced was uh, this summer, we hosted something called the Arctic Arts Summit. So this is a summit that looks at the circumpolar regions. So it was the third Arctic Arts Summit that happened uh, in the world. Uh, the first one was in Finland. The second one was in Norway. And no, sort of the opposite, Norway and then Finland and Canada was the host. And of course, you know, it's an art summit, but the topics and issues raised by convening anybody who had an interest in the circumpolar um, region, emer we, we ended up having conversations about, of course, the climate, climate crisis, about conversations about the economy, conversations about health and well-being. And people were knocking at the door saying, oh, we hear that you're convening this big international and Canadian conference on uh, the arts in the circumpolar region. We would like to be part of it. And we ended up having the most um, fascinating and interesting conversations between musicians and scientists, uh, between visual artists and uh, economists only because the subject was the circumpolar region, but so many dimensions affect the circumpolar region. So that's just one example about how we're able to use the arts and our connections to influence a bigger conversation around the sustainability of the sector. And especially when you think about indigenous communities and Northern communities, they are interconnected. Uh, you can't talk about culture without talking about the land and the environment. So again, that's just one, example uh, to demonstrate how um, we do have tremendous capacity to influence and connect. Thank you. Indeed, the arts are very powerful catalysts to be able to do this. And certainly for Hong Kong, I would love to see the Arts Development Council convene such a meeting across different sectors as well. But coming back to the main point, oops, Benny has left. So it's between you and I now, Michelle. No, Benny's here. Oh, great. Wonderful. Oh, no. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I can stay for one more question, I think. Oh, great. Lovely. OK. So the point is, um, you were referring to the cost of living for artists who actually go to the Edinburgh Fringe to perform. Um, that's very high, given the uh, economic situation. And Michelle, at the same time, coincidentally, raised the issue of artists actually leaving the sector during the pandemic because they couldn't make a living. We, we can talk about the arts and policies uh, till the cows come home, but the important people at the core of why the arts work, aside from arts administrators, marketing, arts educators, are the artists. What are some of your uh, ideas on helping artists to enhance their livelihood for the Fringe or at the Canada Council? Well, perhaps if I, I go first, and then I'm, I'm afraid I will have to leave the, Thank the you. panel. Uh, you know, the, the, the single biggest challenge which I alluded to in my opening remarks is accommodation costs. And we are looking at all sorts of different, quite radical ideas of how we can make it easier, especially for performers who find it particularly challenging. Um, they may have they're very small shows or they're street performers or whatever. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't want to start to announce things that we're thinking of doing, but we are being as radical as we can be in investigating a range of possibilities um, I mean, we've actually had examples, for example, in Scotland, for sure, where 
we've been, you know, Ukrainian refugees will be having to find ways to to make sure that their their lives are protected. And some of the lessons there could could uh, it might sound kind of strange, but be extended to short term accommodation for artists. I mean, I I am quite I I think it is actually a existential threat to to big festivals if if it just becomes too expensive, because many of the performers that end up you know, they, they do some of the most radical things and so, some have the most radical shows and become very big names in the future and, and, and have very important messages, just cannot afford, based on the, the, the economics of their performances, to, to put on a, a show when the strains and stresses of the cost of living uh, crisis is there. So we're focused on people who most need the help, but also very broad um, pleas for intervention. We actually, we, we, be, we were lobbying Scottish Government on some changes to short-term let rules uh, only in the last week, and there has we've made some progress. So it's back to the convening power. We've got to look at the ways in which we can identify ways in which we uh, enable the artists. But it's not just the artists, production teams, that when, when it's visual, when it's the performing arts, as, as Michelle said, you know, sadly, so many people I know um, across the UK and beyond um, just could not maintain the, the you know a, 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 an occupation in the, the the culture field, and it wasn't actually just performers and artists; it was, but much more broadly, people who actually make the sector tick. So, um, I think we we have to we have to be very radical and innovative, and be very focused. And back to my opening comments, not allow our ambition to be blunted by the fact that it's difficult. It's, it's, it's really important we don't. Yes, perhaps t digital technology would come into play here as well, that you can do this remotely yeah. might be one possibility. It's, it's definitely one possibility, but, you know, live performance for performing arts has got to, you know, continue to be at the epicentre, I think, of, of, of what a, a physical fringe looks like and other festivals, I think, that are similar. But, yeah, I mean, we uh, we've got to just make leave no stone unturned, I'm afraid. Thank you, Benny. I wish you all uh, the best. I'll, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very Thanks. much for joining Bye. us. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle, we were talking about artists' livelihood. How are we supposed to enhance it? What are your ideas in your five-year plan? Right. No, I mean, for sure... Uh, We've we've seen the fragility um, of artists, workers who are often, you know, part of what we call an atypical employment situation. You know, they have um, they have short term projects that they're associated with. So they're not, you know, what I would call like a, a government employee or somebody that has um, uh, stability. And, and the pandemic has really revealed that precarity. So there's, first of all, at the Canada Council, we directly fund artists. And I know that not it's not, not every single organization or arts funder that does that, but we've maintained and prioritized ensuring that artists uh, benefit from direct funding from the Canada Council. So that's one, one thing. However, what we do see is that this, concept of an atypical employment status leaves workers in the sector in a situation that's quite precarious because they don't, in Canada, have um, the same access to pensions, collective bargaining rights, social security and unemployment benefits, which many other uh, employed people have. Like I'll use government employees as an example. That's part of your package when you work for the government. But um, so what we are doing at the Canada Council is working with within uh, to look at a whole of government approach. So we are working with our uh, government department that looks after all of our social security benefits programs to redefine what might be accessible for artists who are working in this atypical employment uh, situation. So we are also talking with our Canadian revenue agency that looks at how taxation works. So we're really trying to um, advocate for the, the career and um, sustainability of people who work in the arts sector uh, in order for, the, for them to, for these government departments who run these big 
social benefit programs, for them to understand the situation of independent cultural workers and to be able to also then advise artists on what is accessible to them. Because often that's another thing that people, you know, who don't have the inside knowledge of how the government works don't understand all the resources that may be available to them. So that's just one example of how we're trying to address the question of artist remuneration and the precarity um, of the individual artists. Thank you, Michelle. I have tons more questions, especially one on peer <laughs> assessment. That would be most interesting. And there are two questions have come in online. Unfortunately, one question is for Benny, and he's unable to be with us now. So if I may read the second question to you, Michelle. Of course. While arts activities were forced to stop at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a huge awareness given to the arts and cultural industry, which is intangible but relevant and essential to our lives. But for now, at the post-pandemic era, the discussion goes back to the question of economic recovery. How can arts funders and artists help to raise more awareness of the industry? So this, in a way, tags yeah. on um, naturally to your reply. Of course. And, you know, that is very much a question that we debate all the time because now. So what happened in Canada is that during the pandemic, we received from the government a lot of what was called emergency funding which was, you know, rescue, uh, you know, uh, organizations and artists who were, you know, had their gigs cut, their en employment ended, uh, audiences were gone. But there's a cost to everything. And so the question of economic benefit and economic value and what's the impact um, is now the questions that are being posed because every department, uh, and I'm sure it's across the world, is looking at retrenching and um, you know, uh, working on the deficits. So we are we are uh, all challenged by how do we make the case to not only keep the funding we have, but to increase our funding. And our um, strategies involve uh, data. <laughs> I have to say we have been working for for many years, or at least the last five years, in a very concerted manner which is to develop what we call our performance dashboards. We know that for some sectors, especially when you talk to departments of finance, uh, you need to demonstrate evidence. You can't just say the arts are great, the arts are inspiring. We know that, the ones who work in the arts sector, and we understand why it's important to continue to support it. But when you're trying to argue uh, for the... Uh, your your case, I guess, your budget cases when you go to government, uh, you're also competing with many other sectors who all have very value valuable um, reasons to be funded. What we're able to demonstrate is concretely the impact of arts funding, and that is through very robust data analytics. So we starting to um, try to make the linkages between investing in certain regions and what are the economic benefits around employment, especially employment, um, audiences, so the revenues that we're able to uh, um, demonstrate the impact of. And that is done through collecting financial data and um, other data points that demonstrate those questions. But if, if you're not able to demonstrate evidence of the impact of the arts, it makes your arguments very challenging. So uh, this is just one example, but for us, we really invested in a quite sophisticated and robust data analytics capacity to be able to, um, to show the numbers <laughs> as to why uh, investing in the arts is an actual very sound uh, financial investment, as well as as many social other and other benefits. Thank you so Thank much you for, for that. Um, I would say touche because arts research and data collection is really crucial to the entire existence of the arts sector. And definitely arts research is something that we in Hong Kong need to work more fully on. Now we're actually at the end of our session. And may I ask the beautiful lady who is an MC, um, uh, I wrap up now. Would that so, be all right? Yes, please. thank you. So, on behalf of the Hong Kong Arts Development Council, this year's International Arts 
Leadership Roundtable 2022, may I thank Mr. Benny Higgins again and Miss Michelle Chowler for having spent the last hour with us. And for everybody else online or in the audience, have a very good evening, keep warm and stay safe. Thank you and goodbye from us. Thank you.